Disengaged, frustrated, impatient. Our panel of Generation Y voters expressed a range of opinions, none of which suggested that they are content with the political system the way it is. Does the democratic system need to change, or do young voters have to adapt themselves to the rules of political life? To help us understand the political mindset of Generation Y, we welcome Jane Hilderman. She is research manager at Samara, the think tank dedicated to improving political participation, and Peter Lowen, political scientist at the University of Toronto, Mississauga, that's UTM, and with the Monk School of Global Affairs at U of T. And it's good to have you here again, and you here for the first time. Thanks. Let's put these numbers up, Jane. These are from Elections Canada, and then I'll get you to tell us what the story behind these numbers are. But they really do tell not a great story, frankly, uh, frankly rather. Here we go, 18 to 24s, as we suggested in the previous discussion, fewer than 40% of the people vote. As you get older, you tend to vote more as boomers and then seniors. And then apparently at the age of 75, you don't vote so much anymore. But let's go through this. You see these numbers. What's the story behind them in your view? So I guess the question is, does that graphs trend hold up from 40 years ago to today? And to some degree it does. Young voters have always voted less than their older counterparts. It's something we call the life cycle effect. They're going through when you turn 18 and are eligible to vote for the first time, you're often living in a new city away from home, at school or taking on a new job, and it can be harder to, to get organized to go vote. Sure. But today, in 2011, we're seeing much, much lower levels of young people voting. So in 1960, two thirds of eligible first time voters made it to the ballot box. Two thirds? Two thirds in 1960. In 19... And today only a third do. <laughs> so we're seeing young people not starting to vote. And if they don't start to vote, we know because voting is a habit that they won't be as likely to vote as they get older. <laughs> so we're, we're starting to see a trend that will probably continue on as Gen Y ages. You teach this stuff, right? You mm -hmm. teach political science. So the young people that you deal with on a regular basis are already kind of interested and engaged in all of that. Right. So what's going on with your kids that clearly is not going on with the rest of the young population? Yeah, I think there's, there's, there's a couple of things, and Jane's quite right that the young people are always going to vote less than, than, than older people, but the question now is are they, are they voting even less than young people voted a generation ago? Um, I think there are really uh, kind of two big contributing factors. One is that young people have less of a sense of duty than, their, uh, than the generations before them did. So if you ask them, do you think that voting is a duty, do you think it's a choice, they're much more likely to say that it's a choice rather than an obligation. Hmm. That's the first one. And then the second one is that the things which make us politically attuned, buying a home, maybe getting married and having someone else in the home with whom we discuss politics or, or plan our day even, um, getting jobs where you're making a bit more money and you've got a bit more income tax coming off, these things are all happening later on for young people. And those things are all, uh, 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 drivers of turnout, if you will. So, so these things are occurring at a later rate as well. So the entry into politics is delayed. The really uh, worrying thing about it, as Jane says, is that it might be the case, and the research is a bit muddled on this, but it might be the case that it's the first elections that really matter, your first mm -hmm. two or three. And if you form the habit then, you'll be a voter. If you don't form the habit then, you won't be a voter. So, so as the, soon as you're 18, get out there and vote and it becomes a habit. Well, that's what we hope, because then people realize yeah. voting's quite easy, right? It's not yeah. difficult and you learn the mechanics of it. Mm -hmm. So the question, the kind of unanswered one is, as this generation of folks get older, are they going to, you know, are they going to correct the, the, the non-voting mm -hmm. at a great enough rate for them to look like their parents? So and your students seem particularly duty-bound then, eh? They like politics and they're, they're well, voters. Well, they're strange folks because they choose to study political science in <laughs> some ways. But, uh, uh, yeah, I think a good number of them probably feel an obligation to vote and a good number of them are interested in politics and, and, are, and are taken mm -hmm. up by it. But, you know, among their counterparts, if you looked across all university students and all young people outside of university, they just don't feel these obligations mm -hmm. about any range of things, but voting's one of them. Jane, I've always felt that... It, it, once you get sick and you realize you need a good health care system there for you, or once you have children in the public school system and you realize good schools are important, that's one, I mean, those are two pretty compelling reasons to get interested in politics. And if you're 18 or 24 or something like that, neither of those things is probably a factor in your life. Is that another explanation why young people just aren't into it? I think in my discussions with young people, if you ask them if they care about something in their community or in their city or in their province or country, they often can think about name something, whether it's the environment or you know safety in their neighborhood um, or job prospects. They have things that they care about, I think, regardless of whether they've 
are buying a house yet or you know having a kid in the school system. Uh, the question is, do they see those things being affected by politics and and whether they think politics is a useful lever for them to affect change and to those things? no and no, as we've discovered. I think that the panel that you in, had engaged around the table mm -hmm. illustrated that there's some significant doubt about the effectiveness of, of voting, um, certainly, and maybe politics more broadly to affect those changes or to actually make a difference in some people's lives. But these people don't even like politics. They don't share stories about it on social media. They don't flip articles to each other, that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm hearing that all over the place. That's well, so disappointing, don't you think? It's actually interesting because at Samar, we've been trying to also focus on not just voting as, as political behavior, but a whole spectrum of activities. So we've measured uh, 20 different activities, everything from discussing politics in person to discussing it online to the more traditional activist activities like signing a petition and protesting, to the civic activities like volunteering in your community, to those more for formal political ones like joining a party or donating to a campaign. Um, and we've actually found that those under 35 were as active or if, more a or if not more active than other Canadians in almost all those areas, including online discussion and sharing things on social media, but fell off compared to average Canadians in that formal political arena. Hmm. So I don't think it's entirely an absence of sharing and discussing, although those numbers are still low in maybe the larger picture. You're talking about maybe 50% of people under 35 saying that they've had a political conversation in the last year. And that's higher than Canadians. But the point being that, um, again, it's not translating to the formal political arena. One of the things, Peter, we heard in our discussion with uh, the Gen Y crowd is that they have a real craving for authenticity, which they don't find in politics today. And I guess the question is, where does this craving for authenticity come from? Because it feels new. Yeah, I wonder how much we mistake uh, celebrity for authenticity mm. in some ways. And I think if you actually look at, uh, look at, for example, the two principal opponents right now in federal politics, Stephen Harper and, and, and Justin Trudeau. I think Justin Trudeau is a, 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 an authentic person. Wait a minute. What happened to the opposition leader? Well, we can come to Mr. Mulcair in a second, but let's just, let's just use those two as an example. I think, I think Mr. Trudeau is a, a relatively authentic person. I think he's genuinely a family man. Uh, I think we all know about his background, and he's, and he's true to that in some sense. He doesn't try and hide it. But I think Stephen Harper is an authentic person. I mean, he, he seems to me to be an authentically middle-class person. He's been prime minister for now going on eight years. It probably changes a person. But he doesn't strike me as, as inauthentic. I think what we have, though, are, are politicians who don't strive to necessarily connect with people with the language that they want them to connect with. And we take this to be inauthenticity in some ways, when really they're people doing a job. Right? And it, it seems to me that it's, a, it's, an interesting, it's, it's an interesting question only because we don't ask for people to be authentic in many other fields. Right? What, who would want an authentic CEO? We would never even <laughs> sort of talk about this in some ways. We right? do or, demand this in politics, though. Yes, and it's, it, it's, it, I don't know why we do, to be honest with you. Well, yeah. once upon a time, we used to demand charisma, like from Justin's father. Sure, sure. Or um, we were happy when we got it. Yeah. yeah. And nobody seems to be demanding charisma from Stephen Harper. I think they understand that's, mm -hmm. that's not a part of his authenticity package. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But certainly Justin Trudeau is going a long way in thanks in no small measure to that, right? Mm -hmm. Fair to say? And do young people care about that and pick up on it? I think, I, yeah, I think on these standards of, or this, these definitions we have of, of authenticity, he gets there. But I think th there, was a, there was a fine example last week about, uh, in, 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 it involves Mr. Trudeau about authenticity and sort of straight talk. We're told we want politicians who give us the straight goods and, and tell us the way it is. A Stats Can report came out on the state of the middle class in Canada. And the story it told last week is that it's a great time to be in the middle class, and it's much better than it was 10 years ago. And you know, the response from most folks who otherwise laud Statistics Canada said, oh, this can't be true. People <laughs> feel like times are tougher. Yeah. Well, this isn't evidence-based policy, and it's not authentic. Right? It's telling people what they want to hear. So I, I think, you know, we can find example, I don't want to pick on Mr. Trudeau, we can find example after example after example of people sort of saying, well, we want the straight goods. We want politicians to be honest with us. And then we vote for the folks who promise us more than they can deliver. <laughs> and we, uh, we get mad at folks who tell us things are, you know, better than you think they are. And that is not a new phenomenon either. No. Jane, you've talked about the need for symbolic leadership. What does that mean? So in the sense, uh, as Peter was outlining, it's perhaps more than just the sum of a, a policy platform, but what a leader 
might project as the thing, the values that they espouse and the vision that they carry for the country. And it's um, much harder to sort of, I think, quantify uh, compared to say, you know, a platform that has a check mark next to certain policy commitments. And it's very much harder to, um, you know, guarantee it's, you can't manufacture that sort of symbolism in a very authentic way in many cases. So it has, there has to be an element of that authenticity there for it to ring true, I think. Um, Obama, President Obama is often held up as a great example of that sort of a, a symbolic leader who managed to articulate a vision and a value set that caught people's attention and many, many of those people who might not otherwise have been as engaged in uh, the American election and American politics. Do we have that in Canada? Something similar? Um, I think that we don't have someone certainly at the national level in the same way resonating in the way that President Obama did in the United States. Um, that doesn't mean it couldn't happen. And I think that it doesn't mean our current political leadership leader and leaders can't as try to do emulate some of the t things that Obama did really well, including using platforms that are now widely available in social media and the like to, to try to reach people with a message um, that's going to resonate with them. Um, and there's a lot of more tools now available to try to figure out um, you know, what sort of messages might do that trick. I'm going to be so presumptuous as to put a suggestion out there on the table. The mayor of Calgary, Nahid Nenshi, might get as close to symbol the kind of symbolic leadership you talk about. He checks off a lot of very interesting, distinctive boxes. Um, anyway, I don't know if that requires further comment, but that might be the closest thing we have to it in the country. Do you know this comedian, Billy Connolly? S septuagenarian guy who once said the desire to be a politician should bar you for life from ever being one. Ah, very nice. Yeah. Uh, why is the desire for public service so readily disbelieved by young people and maybe not only the voting young? Uh, I, I think probably because it's, it's plainly dishonest on its face in some sense. I mean I, I, I quite admire people who, who aspire to political office. I think it's a very difficult job and it's a job most people couldn't do and, and don't want for that reason. But I think some people do it because they, they want to further themselves and it's, it, it's, it's an act of self-actualization. And there's nothing wrong with that. Mm. There's nothing wrong with the idea that people would say, I'm going to work hard to represent you better than anyone else will and I want your vote for that reason because I want to be your representative. It is an act of public service in many cases. People are making great personal uh, and professional sacrifices. But I think when people say, you know, the reason why I want to be a politician is only because I want to serve the public, it seems unlikely. <laughs> you know, it seems, it seems unlikely that politicians are solely driven by a desire to serve the public. They probably like the job, right? And, oh, and, and, and to me, that's a shortage a, of people running for no, it. No, sure. and to me, that's a plainly appropriate and, and defensible <laughs> thing. But I think that it, it's not believable on its face. It is possible to sort of look at the political scene in this country. And let's, let's be frank, we don't have fascists running against communists, right? The, 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 the amount of differences among the political parties in our country is kind of blessedly not very extreme. And could young people just quite appropriately conclude, it doesn't really matter what I do. They're all basically going to do roughly the same thing anyway. Now, those people who cover it carefully know that there are differences among the parties, but they're not huge differences in the way that they might be in other countries, right? Fair to conclude that? I'm going to refer to what one of the panelists, Matt, said. He's mm -hmm. like, I'm prepared to be engaged with and marketed to, but I, it needs to be done well. <laughs> and I think that's maybe we've come to a gap now where, you know, youth have not been voting at the same levels and political parties and candidates know that. And they are they have limited resources come election time and they have to try to allocate those thing those resources effect effectively. So why bother targeting people who they know aren't going to show up anyway? Well I think it's natural that those sort of calculations have to be come into play to some extent. Hmm. So it's a challenging sort of cycle that we have to break that asks youth to not just give up and step out because the more you do that the greater the risk is that um, you're not going to be, have your door knocked on or you're not going to have an ask come for your participation and your views mm. to be represented. I know you're not a geneticist, but again, you do have these young people, which is a kind of a living, breathing cohort of 
uh, of a focus group for what we're talking about here today. So I do want to pick your brains on this. Is it possible that the young people who are very politically engaged are just differently wired? There's something about their DNA that's different from everybody else, and that's why they're into it. Yeah, I, I think the research is pretty clear that that some of the variation in, in voter turnout and political participation more broadly is related to personality. So people who are more extroverted are more involved in politics. People who are more conscientious are more likely to uh, believe that voting is a duty. So there's a link between, very well established link between personality types and political participation. And there's very well established links between personality types and the genes that your parents, parents give you. So, you know, basic differences between people matter for turnout. But it doesn't explain the differences in turnout across generations. It's not that we have more, we have less conscientious people now or less extroverted people. The distributions are the same, but it's that uh, whatever it is about our political system isn't drawing out those people at the same rate that it drew them up before. Mm -hmm. But yeah, our, our personalities matter for how we get involved in politics and the types of politics we get involved in and when we get involved. I know because we're all interested in it, we think it's better if people participate in it. But let's just, in our last couple of minutes here, really go back to first principles here. If we want people to be civically minded, engaged citizens, if that's not redundant, you can give blood, you can work for an NGO, you can volunteer at a soup kitchen. There's lots of different ways of doing it that have nothing to do with politics. Is that okay? I think it's a question of not um, politics or civic engagement, but civic engagement and politics. Uh, politics is still um, the sort of hand on the tiller of state, and our governments spend billions of dollars every year, and they make big decisions about the sort of policies that do affect um, day-to-day -day life. Mm. And so if you really want to make social change, I, I would advise you can't give up the lever of government. You'd be losing a significant uh, avenue to make a difference. Peter, how about you on that? Yeah, my view is, is sort of twofold. One is that we live in the, we live in the best possible time in the history of, 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 of humanity. And, and I think living in Canada at this point in time makes us very, very lucky. There's very good reason to be content with that and to say I'm happy to see it go on as it does. And, but I think that it's a first principles question. And for me, the question is, is voting one of those things you should do regardless of the outcome? That in itself, it's a moral act. And I think it is. I think it's a categorical imperative. People can disagree on this point, but I think for me, it's a first principles question. And I've not always voted, and, and that's a point of shame in some ways. But I think that as a first principle, we should recognize that voting is, is, is a morally correct thing to do. Even if you don't like them, go up and refuse your ballot or go and spoil your ballot or something yeah, like that. Or, or register your discontent. Yeah, that's right. Or acknowledge that there are differences between these parties. They're not life and death, and yeah. thank, thank goodness for that. But there are differences between them, right? And, you know, go, go cast a vote. And if you don't want to cast a vote, that's, that's fine in some ways. But it's not the fault of the parties for that. There are differences between them, and they want you to vote, mm -hmm. right? Gotcha. Yeah. Peter Lowen, UTM and the Monk School of Global Affairs, and Jane Hilderman from Samara, thanks to both of you for coming in tonight. Thank you. My pleasure. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.